short basis. And rather than talking about how I use it with some of my long-term players, what I wanted to do today is just kind of show you how I used it in a recent one-hour lesson or it was just a one-off lesson uh, with this gentleman. Um, the the uh, technology that we have here is just fantastic. I, I so enjoy using it, but the opportunity to be able to measure people and really chart how we, uh, what the progress is that we made and then also be able to chart over a period of time exactly what's been done, uh, more so than just looking at video, has been something that I've really loved about KVEST. So what I want to just start, start off with is just uh, for the next half hour, uh, talk about the process I went through during a one-off, one-hour lesson with this gentleman, and uh, then open the floor to questions and have you come back and uh, let me know uh, if you have questions about which choices I made or even uh, what I might do next with this player, then we can discuss that at the end. So I'm going to move off camera here and we'll take a look at, uh, at what we started with with this player. Now with this player, we're going to start by looking at some video. I typically, I work uh, in, uh, in, at a facility where I've got an indoor hitting bay where we use the K-Vest a lot. And then I do most of my teaching outdoors. Uh, that's where they play, that's where I like to teach them. With this gentleman, he was in from out of town and uh, Basically, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's a new computer. There we go. Um, so with this, with this gentleman, basically, I, I started off asking him what his ball flight was. He was hitting a pull hook. Uh, and then sometimes flaring it out to the right. He's hitting a 7-iron here and was hitting this thing about 130 yards, 135 yards. Uh, I asked what he wanted to do. He said he wanted to hit a push draw, and then I asked what he had been working on with another instructor. And his other instructor had him working on really stabilizing his back leg on the back swing, feeling like he didn't create much of a, a lower body rotation but then also had him working on accelerating the upper body uh, in the downswing, trying to get him to swing left. And I described what I thought, uh, what problems that might cause. You know, when you swing left, it's going to tend to take the path left and lead to uh, pulls and draws more or cuts, not a high push draw like he was describing that he wanted. So this was basically the, the video that we saw. Uh, going back and going through. Uh, and then we decided to go inside and take a look at it with the K-Vest. So we'll shift over to that. Now, this was his very first swing. And here is the uh, kinematic sequence graph. We can see some interesting stuff going on here. What I like to do is kind of run through all the graphs. Now, I don't tell him what any of the graphs mean, per se, uh, until it's time to actually start making some changes. But what we look at here is, uh, you know, takeaway sequence was, was okay. We see a little bit of wobbling with his, uh, you know, the upper body, lower body, the lines aren't quite smooth. What I saw is a lot of interlacing here with the lower body, upper body as he started to transition, and then a really poor acceleration of the lower body as it goes out. And then you can see no, no real good stabilization uh, beyond impact here, with, or I'm sorry, before impact with the lower body. Uh, upper body had a second peak that was well after impact, so that was interesting. And I think that was, I, the more I talked to him, the more that was a, a concept that was he was misunderstanding. Uh, when we looked at speeds, she's got over here 376 on the pelvis, which is a relatively low pelvis uh, peak. I was looking to increase that a bit. 612, his upper body was decent, uh, and his hands were a little bit slower than you know your low tour average there. But you see a lot of fanning in the curves. and. Things that I wanted to see and, and work on were going to be more in that, that transition area. Again, one of the things that I've found in working with this is the better the transition sequence and timing for people, and the more separate we can get those things crossing, the better players do. Um, one thing I do always check uh, during this initial stage is just uh, the, the move we call the 20-40 rule. Uh, we want to see about 20 degrees of rotation of the pelvis and then about 40 degrees of the upper body to show that we're getting a, a good loading during the backswing. So he was doing a good job with that. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the 
pelvic bend graph. We look at that. Uh, he's got the de descending uh, pelvic bend here, a huge bump, which is a little bit too big, and then it didn't quite clear out the way you'd expect it to. So the pelvic bend wasn't great here. Uh, quick run through his numbers here. Uh, top of the backswing, we're seeing 31.6 degrees of rotation. And in a guy this age, I would say that's probably a little bit shy. I don't think he's going to generate the most power he possibly could. But again, it's not necessarily something that uh, jumped out at me as being a huge problem yet. And it's something he'd worked really hard to do to, uh, to restrict lower body work. So I didn't want to jump on that right away as well. Uh, at impact, he's gotten to a fairly decent spot. Uh, with his lower body in terms of getting it open. It's 42.3 degrees open, and his side bend is looking good at about 10 degrees here, so I liked all of that. Upper body angles uh, started a little bit more bent forward than we might like. Top of the back swing, he's only got about 64.8 degrees of rotation, so at this point I checked his, uh, his torso rotation ability. I uh, had him uh, do a seated torso rotation. And he actually had quite a bit more than that. So this is about 30 degrees. He got about 40 to 42 degrees worth of uh, torso rotation, that seated torso rotation test. So that gave us another area where we, we had an opportunity to create a much better X-factor stretch on the downswing than what we were seeing. So when we looked at his spine uh, graph here, he did get a little bit of it. You can kind of see that it's flat along the bottom, drops a little bit right through here. And what I wanted to see to try to get him a little bit more distance and then also create a position that was going to help him start the ball out to the right and, and create a little bit of a draw. I wanted to go after his, uh, his uh, transition sequence and then pelvic speed kind of in that initial start of the downswing. Uh, the first thing we did was we worked on hip twister phase one, which is this one. I wanted to test his ability to create, whoops, here we're testing his ability to create some separation. And he could do a, a credible job of doing it. You can see a little bit of movement in there. But basically, we're just kind of getting him the idea that lower body is going to transition first, that we want it to accelerate as fast as possible, and that we wanted to have a little bit of delay with the upper body as it starts. And I apologize for the videos here. They, uh, they aren't as good a quality as I might have gotten because I actually wasn't expecting to share this stuff. This actually was just for his own use. Uh, second exercise we worked on was hip, hip twister phase two. And here we're doing just about a, a 30 degree rotation of the torso going back and then trying to create that separation of the lower body going forward. And then from here, I did some orange whip swings with him to let his arms feel like they were dragging a little bit more. Uh, and then again, just kind of emphasized to him that it was a concept that he was missing more so than it was a physical uh, change that needed to, to happen to his body. So he was able to do this pretty successfully in a very short period of time. So the first swing we're looking at here happened at 120. By the time we got to the second swing that we looked at, we're only at 134. And what we saw in that short period of time, kinematic sequence graph, we're seeing a much better separation. You still see some interlacing of the uh, upper body to the lower body lines, but we're seeing much better separation there. Lower body absolutely crosses much earlier. Uh, and we see a lot better acceleration of the lower body in the early stages. Now, he didn't maintain that. And it peaked very late. But what we got now is we got another 30 degrees of pelvic speed out of that. So he's up to 415, where he was at 377 before. Uh, obviously, that's going to result in a, a spine graph that looks quite a bit different. So we've got a little bit better, uh, a little bit deeper trough here post impact. And we were getting now up to about a, a 10 degree separation between lower body and upper body at impact. On a couple of the other swings that I captured of this gentleman, uh, we saw that the upper body was actually passing the lower body before impact. And again, that's one of those things. If the upper body ever gets open to the lower body before impact, you see a lot of difficulties with, uh, with power and uh, control in there. So again, I, I like the way we saw the changes here. Again, this was about 15 minutes later. 
pretty darn quick. Still pretty messy in terms of what his pelvic bend graph is doing. Uh, it starts well here, but we're not getting any great engagement of his lower body. This would be something that if I knew I was going to see this gentleman quite a bit, I would start working on his pelvic bend graph and get him to understand that a little bit better. But in a one-hour situation where we're just going to see somebody and we want to improve their improve a graph that's really going to create good performance for them, I found that getting that uh, that transition graph in better shape is is a must. Uh, coming back into his pelvic lines, uh, this one's an interesting one now. Uh, his pelvic rotation at the top here is 29 degrees. You'll remember it was 31 earlier, but if we go back to his peak pelvic rotation, you know that we've got a transition that is lower body starting first. We see that he actually increased the amount of overall rotation that he was getting before. So now he's up to almost 36 degrees, which is, is higher where I would like to see it with him. Uh, down the road, I would actually give him the green light to get a little bit more free in opening up his pelvis. Probably like to see him peaking out his pelvis at about 40, 41, uh, and then again, seeing closer to a 30, 30, between 30 and 35 degrees of rotation at the top of the backswing. But seeing again that the, the maximal rotation of the pelvis happened well before that uh, top of the backswing position. At impact, now we're seeing, because he's getting a little bit better acceleration, we're seeing 46 degrees open. That's about as large an open position I'd like to see. But when we go back to kinematic sequence position, we notice that A, it doesn't peak in the right spot. We'd want it to peak before the uh, halfway down in the downswing. We'd also like to see a lot better deceleration uh, portion of this pelvic graph. And that's actually one thing I did try to work on him with very briefly. But again, the changes we made here were, were to somebody who had great capability, who could also uh, who just had a, a slight misconception to what he was doing. And for those of you who work a lot on the vest, no, this is the easiest thing to change. When somebody has a good capability and a bad concept, changing that concept is a pretty easy, uh, easy fix. Now I'm going to jump back over to the video because the next drill I worked on him with uh, to try to help him with pelvic deceleration and torso acceleration was a little split stance drill with, uh, with the right foot back left foot forward, and talking to him a little bit about creating better uh, shear forces in the feet, which help to stabilize the pelvis, but also in creating a little bit uh, more pressure in that lead foot on the downswing. And we took some swings this way with him. And he was doing pretty well with it, but it seemed to start overwhelming him. Uh, so jumping to a, the next swing, so four minutes later, on the same gentleman. Four minutes later was this one. And what we saw on that, so after just doing about probably four or five practice swings with a split stance drill, we see that we get a little bit sharper peak with the pelvis and better deceleration. Now the timing of that isn't very good obviously, but pretty good size changes uh, again in a, in a 15 minute period here working on just several different little swing changes to him. Uh, again, the, the hip twister phase one, hip twister phase two to help him get used to transitioning the lower body uh, before the upper body. Uh, and then lead leg swings with the, with the front foot forward to help him feel the pressure in his feet a little bit better. Now, I let this swing go, I'm sorry, this drill go because it started causing some problems in ter terms of this concept. It was too many things. And one of the things that I've learned with, with the uh, KVEST and, and as a 20-year teacher is that if you try to work on too many things, they get confused and don't end up getting anything out of the lesson. So I really let this one go. I did make a page in his, uh, his e-book through GAS video that he's able to look at that I said, this is down the road. Once you feel really great with your transition sequence, then let's work on this split stance swing. But for today, let's ignore that for now. Okay, so at the end of this session, basically what I wanted him to do is have something very solid that he could work on, that he'd know how to work on it out on the driving range, how to work on it at home, and then also how to try to start putting it into play at the golf course. 
And this is where we came in next, uh, heading back out to the driving range. We set up a just a routine for him to do. So this one's going to include uh, part of the hip twister kind of section, a couple of practice swings to feel it, and then his execution of the shot moving into the golf ball. So he's doing a couple of the hip twister phase drills. He's got that transition drill where you can really see him drive the lower body more aggressively. And then he's going to move in front of this rope. I keep the rope there to have them drill behind the rope. And now you're just executing when you move up in front of the rope. Okay, so he had, a, he had a great understanding of, of things that he was trying to fix, which was that transition sequence, how he was going to fix it with some exercises at home, hip twister phase one, hip twister phase two. And then I gave him a step change of direction drill to do also at home. And then when he was practicing a routine that he was going to go through to create this movement pattern, both going back and going through. Okay. So heading back to KVEST here. Again, we had uh, three things that I really, or two things that I really wanted to get him doing was was to transition better with the lower body, and then uh, accelerate better with the lower body, and then things that I would look for later on would be to help him start to feel how he's going to decelerate the pelvis and accelerate the the torso in a much more aggressive manner and a, a more efficient manner. So. Steve, that's basically what I went through in a uh, one-hour session with this guy and some of the changes we made. Um, let's open it up for some questions and see what people have. That's great, Don. Thank you very much. Uh, we did have a number of questions that came in. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Malcolm Young. I'm going to pull Malcolm off, uh, off mute. Steve, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me okay? Hello? Can you hear me okay, Don? Hello? Don? Yes. You can hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Great. Uh, so I'm going to pull Malcolm Young off mute. He had a question about some of the physicalities you were working with. Just a second, yes. let me find him. Malcolm, can you hear us? I can, yeah. Fantastic. And do you want to repeat your question for the audience? Yeah, just curious if, if any physical screen was done, given that the visual age may be of the client, if a physical screen was done before the changes? I did just a couple of quick physical screens. I did not do a thorough physical screen with this uh, player. Uh, the yeah. things that I wanted to find out were uh, seated torso rotation. Uh, I checked his ability on the uh, tr uh, standing torso rotation or ro uh, drill and the standing pelvic rotation. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Fantastic. Can you give us a little more information about those screens, if there was anything particular that popped up that was of interest to you or a potential issue? He had, uh, he was very good at the, uh, the pelvic rotation drill. Upper body stability was uh, solid. Uh, the torso rotation drill, both seated and standing, were very good. So he had great ability to keep his uh, great stability in the lower body and good mobility in the upper body. Uh, in the seated torso rotation, he was about 40 degrees in both directions. Uh, you know, not torque quality, but definitely better than many that we see. Great, great, thank you. Malcolm, was that helpful? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Awesome, appreciate it. So to, to kind of address that a little bit further, if, if I've got a player that I'm dealing with on a long-term basis, 
I'm going to do a lot more of a physical screen or even have part of my team do the physical screen, where with this gentleman it was a, a one-hour lesson where he was just coming in to be seen once. And the reason I used him as an example was more that as I talk to play, I'm sorry, other teachers and coaches, they're dealing a lot more in this realm. Uh, a lot of them can't relate to me having players that I'm working with for a three or four year period over and over again. So uh, that's why I chose this, this example was just to show you what could be done even in a one hour session with somebody. Fantastic. And Don, what I think might be really helpful, uh, we do have one question that just popped in, but I, I think this would be a, a good little uh, side note to, to mention. Uh, because we do have so many, not only golf professionals, but fitness professionals and medical professionals on today, uh, maybe talk about the way you use your team and you know, how, you, how you function as a group. I know, you know a lot of people that's you know, a difficult starting place for them. Uh, maybe not necessarily as much the golf professionals, but more you know physical therapists, fitness professionals, chiropractors, and how they begin that interaction phase. Can you tell everyone a little bit more about how you do that, how you lead the team? Okay, the the, the, the background and how I got started in this. I met a gentleman in 1997 who had just moved back to uh, Santa Barbara and was an absolute golf nut and he was a, a great manual therapist and fitness trainer with a big background in sports specific rehab and he and I got together and worked in a couple of different directions we worked in um, well he actually the way he got his in with me was that he told me he could stop make my back stop hurting so I was all for that I had to quit quit my playing career because uh, because of a you know back pain and he went through some stretches and did some strengthening activity with me over the course of about six weeks where my back pain basically went away. And he came by one day when I was out practicing back then and asked me uh, if I had looked at my swing to see how it changed. And I said, well, my swing hasn't changed. My swing, my swing is good. It's always been good. Well, my back doesn't hurt. It's just a little bit better. And we put it on video that day and everything that had always plagued my swing and that I'd had trouble with was gone, all those things that I always had to, to work on. And that was the first time I really opened my eyes to the idea that the body played such a giant role in, in how the golf club's going to swing. This was about, again, 97 or 98. So uh, at that point, we started working together with, with players and uh, did so up until he passed away a few years ago. And uh, since then, I have uh, worked with him. You know, up until that point, he was the only person I ever worked with and, and who I trusted completely to, to work with all of my players. Uh, since then, I have developed a little bit more of a team and work through different groups. And I've got a, a, a physical therapy group on staff here uh, that rents space for me at my facility. Uh, and they are great manual therapists and great diagnosticians in terms of, of dealing with any sort of player that has any sort of issue and then coming to a, you know, taking that to a conclusion. And then we've got a, a fitness group here that we work pretty closely with as well, and we run group classes uh, and then individual training through them as well. And when I've got a player that is either hurt or needs some fitness help, I just reach out to those, uh, those professionals on my team to take care of that for me. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have... A couple other questions. Alex Smith, I'm going to pull him off mute. Just a moment. Alex, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you great. You could Perfect. just uh, um, ask the, your question to the audience so they know what, what your question was. Yeah, um, I was just curious that um, if you go to his original, his original um, reading that you took, his pelvis angle was very close to an S posture, I think around about 28 degrees. Did you talk at any point um, about kind of getting a nice neutral pelvis with him? Let me call that one up there again. There we go. So yes, yeah, so if we look at that, he was, yeah, the very first one we took was uh, at 29 degrees. 
Uh, I don't know if you noticed later it got down into the, about the 24 degree position. Uh, we did talk very, very briefly, just less so about talking about his posture, but just his uh, distance from the ball. We got him a little bit closer to the ball, standing a little bit taller, and that, that took care of that posture. Okay, I was just curious as well how much he would actually go into postural when um, when when it's very well, it's very very close to an S posture. Someone uh, uh, quite often actually. Okay. Yeah, so in, again, in a, if let's let's take a look at this guy. If he was coming in and I knew he was going to live that he was living in town and I was going to be able to make some changes with him over a period of time. Um, this is one of my favorite graphs to change. I think it, has, it makes a huge difference uh, on players. This is the pelvic thin graph. And when we look at this one, this guy is at about 29 degrees. Uh, at, well, yeah, 29.7 degrees to start off. Basic shape of it's okay, but partway down you'll notice that he's got this big pelvic bump coming forward. So he ends up almost at 32 degrees of uh, forward bend midway through his downswing. And mm -hmm. In a general sense, that's not going to work very well. You know, I'm sorry, not in a general sense. Over a long period of time, that's not going to work very well. But I found that that's something that's relatively difficult to change because it's so difficult for them to look at either on video or to even feel what's going on. And mm -hmm. I shouldn't say it's difficult to change. It's difficult for them to change on their own without a knowledgeable eye looking at it. And so few other golf professionals uh, you know, that aren't the 100 that are, that are sitting in this webinar right now uh, understand anything about pelvic bend during the golf swing. Okay, thank you. Great, and thanks Alex, and thanks for being on today. Uh, next no, person up, uh, we do have a question from Jason Floyd. Don, you, uh, you did start to get into this, but I'm going to pull Jason off, uh, off mute. Jason, can you hear us? Hi, yes, how are you? I'm doing wonderful today. How is beautiful southern Spain? Very good. Very warm and, uh, well, a bit dark right now because we're evening time, but, uh, yeah, very good. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you could uh, share your question again. Yes, no problem. Hi, Don. How are you? Great. How are you doing, Jason? Very good. Very good. Thanks for putting this on. Very, very, very good. So, uh, yeah, on behalf of, I suppose, everybody, thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing your, your knowledge and your thoughts. Um, no, just, just as we alluded to there, I mean, obviously, you 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 know you've, you've got this student for for a one-off hit uh, an hour, but you know going forward, if if he was to come back and if he was to have let's say a um, a longer-term program, what would be the other areas maybe sort of skipping on beyond the the pelvis? Would you sort of go into? Okay, I I think that's a great question and kind of the area I'd ho I was hoping you guys would get to. I thought that that one of the things that that I see, you know, I, I think a lot of you have seen me on Facebook and and heard of me from there. But I think one of the big mistakes people make is always going after the, uh, the kinematic sequence to try to clean that up first. And the body positions have such a huge effect on the, the uh, kinematic sequence that uh, I think that, that in this situation, on this one-off, it was easy for me to get uh, transition sequence to really make a big difference in this player's ball play. But if I was looking at him from a, a long-term standpoint, things that I would definitely look to, this pelvic bend would be probably the number one area that I would start at. If we look at his, uh, his, uh, his report and we look at his swing summary, you know, he's 30 and 51 there. So standing up a little bit taller would be a great way to do that. And I, and I typically don't like to see more than about you know, 22 degrees, even though the, the range says you can see up to 27. I don't like seeing much more than 22, 23 degrees uh, with players at address. Uh, so that would be something I would definitely work on. Uh, and then, again, for this player, because of his age and his, uh, his size, I would have probably opted for more range of motion rather than less in the pelvis. So over time, I would have worked, again, getting uh, just the overall pelvic movement uh, a lot more sound, uh, particularly that pelvic forward bend, but then also allow him to rotate a little bit more, get a little bit more range of motion in his swing uh, to try to generate some more power for him. Uh, just the transition sequence that we got going there helped him pick up about 12 yards on his 7-iron just during that lesson. So 
I thought that was pretty darn successful, but I would absolutely work on his pelvis and his, uh, his uh, posture moving forward. Yeah, that's great. What, um, how, how did he respond to, uh, did he get him on, on, on live, uh, live feedback, live training? Um, you, you maybe said that earlier, but the, the line we have here is a little bit dodgy with the internet. But, uh. the, uh, so you're talking about the live feedback with uh, the K-Trainer? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just yes. with uh, we did. Yeah. yeah, we did hip twister phase one. He was able to do that pretty well. Hip twister, hip twister phase two was no real problem. Uh, I, I, again, I apologize for those videos. They weren't very good because I didn't expect to use them for anything other than to help remind him what he was supposed to work on. But he was able to do both of those very well and effectively. Uh, and I think again, knowing that he was capable of making this particular change during that day was why I stuck pretty closely with that. Okay, that's great. What, um, was, that, was that his first time on KVS? Was that his first experience? Or? It was, and he, I, I'm not sure how he found me. He was, uh, he was here from Florida. Uh, he was doing a launch uh, up about 40 miles from where we are, and I, I think he had either found me on, uh, online or even found me with the KVS website somehow. But he he definitely was interested in the technology and wanting to use that. Yeah, I think it was uh, it was great just to um, obviously you being polite, but sort of spelling some of the myths and the concept that he'd previously learned from uh, um, other professionals. And I'm, I'm I'm sure when you went down the route of showing the kinematic sequence, i.e., the facts of uh, well, you know what you're trying to do and what you are doing are you know not really relating to the actual reality of your your swing and your movement. So. Right. Well, he didn't understand what was going to cause the draw either. He had a his his, his prior coach uh, from Florida. I don't know who it was. Uh, had him rotating hard left to, to try to get the club head outside the hands on the downswing and get everything rotated left, and that didn't really match with the ball flight he was trying to create either. So we did talk about the ball flight laws and how we wanted face face right of target, path right of face to create that mm -hmm. type of ball flight. That's good. Brilliant. Don, uh, as ever, thanks very much, and uh, well, hopefully we'll see, you, we'll see you soon over in the States. I look forward to it. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jason. Thanks Appreciate your time. All right. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, next question we have from uh, Tim Ward. Uh, Don, Tim has a question on uh, transition foot pressure concepts. Just a second. Okay. Tim, can you hear us okay? Tim? Tim Ward? Uh oh. Uh, we may have lost Tim. Tim's not with us. While we're waiting for that, does anyone else in the audience have any questions for Don? Uh, Don, Alex is asking if you could demonstrate the split stance group, split stance drill. Excuse me. Sure. Uh, Steve, I'm going to have you make sure that I get the camera on properly here. No problem. And does that do it? Uh, your camera looks pretty good. Okay, so you can see the. Is that better? Yep. Uh, all the attendees, if they'd like to make the video bigger. Uh, what they can do, there's a little uh, two white lines uh, between the video and the, the image of Don's screen. If they just hover their mouse over those two white lines, uh, they can actually make the video a little bit bigger for them so they can see it better. Okay, Perfect. so uh, things that, uh, that we talk about. We talk about ground reaction force. We talk about pressure and why do we need those. A lot of this stuff uh, comes directly from my experience talking with Mike Bentley uh, and then with Tim Souser, who is a KVEST uh, uh, principal here. And then uh, in two weeks, I'm actually going to go down to Dallas and talk with uh, Young Hu Kwan and Chris Como on this because this is something that really interests me a lot. Uh, I don't have force plates here, so I'm having to guess on this stuff. But the, the things that I've had a lot of success with is that 
when we work on the base platform position, one of the things that occurs when we get into a great posture position and we start to load up into the backswing, we feel that there's a lot of pressure more in the lead foot and you feel almost an arching of the foot when we get into that position. So two ways we do it, if I'm trying to enhance the backswing movement, we'll do a split stance with the left, I'm sorry, the right foot forward and work on having them feel that movement where they're going to load up and create a, this one's great for the downward pressure on that trail foot. Uh, the other thing I feel that when we're working on this is if I want to really uh, help an upper body rotation, I get into what we call the shear forces or the right foot shearing forward. So I try to slide that, that front foot forward and push the, the back foot back. And if I equalize the pressure on both feet, my pelvis gets a lot more stable. So this is another drill I'll have people do for a backswing move where we really push forward and back almost like we're sliding that front foot towards the camera, rear foot away. Uh, with the player that we were looking at, he had no deceleration of the pelvis. Even though he was really accelerating his, his torso and his arms well, and what that generally indicates to me is that he's not using his feet on the ground very well. So what we were trying to work on with him, with a slight split stance here, as we transition and come towards the front foot, what we want to feel is that we stomp down on that front foot and we push it forward as the rear foot is going to push backwards this way. And what that's going to do again is equalize the pressure against the pelvis and allow the upper body to rotate. So I feel a lot of pressure into that lead foot. And Don, that goes right along. Uh, there may be a s slight continuation you can make. Michael Wood was asking uh, how you, some of the ways that you describe shear force to amateur players. How do I sh uh, step out of the line right here real quick? One of the ways is with these valve slides. So one way just to kind of demonstrate this to them is, is if you have them swing on this, I put the valve slide under the trail foot. As you would drive down, they'll invariably slide the foot along the ground that way. So again, getting them to understand that we're pressing against the ground to help the pelvis and the torso rotate. Um, demonstrations like this can be a great one. So. So shear force in terms of the ground, I'll use these valve slides and show them which direction their feet should be sliding. In terms of pressure, the uh, balance pillows is one of the ones that I use a lot. You know, I've just got a few of them sitting here. So as they would take it back, I'd feel to have them feel that they're pressing down into that trail foot to pop the pillow. Or on the downswing then, transitioning and driving in and getting that pr downward pressure where we al also see a little bit of a forward knee bend here. And then that pressing against that to help them create the rotation of the pelvis and the torso going forward. Awesome. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Uh, we have a question coming from uh, Chela Quintana. Uh, Cella coaches a lot of juniors, and I know that's really one of your big passions, Don. I'm going to take her off mute. Just a moment. Cella, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? Uh, I only teach. Uh, I only teach kids, uh, all ages, and. Uh, when I put the K vest, uh, they they I cannot I cannot use the K vest all the time with them because for me I, I feel that they get confused with the K vest. Uh, is that normal? Absolutely, I get confused with the K vest. <laughs> so what what do what do you do with them? Uh, do you do you like for example if you're teaching a kid like three times a week, you see like I have a school, and I also see them personally. Uh, how many times do you put the K-Vest on? I, I put the K-Vest on rarely and very quickly with juniors. Uh, again, so a lot of the stuff I will do is I'll be training, and the reason I use the K-Vest is, is I will use it in a K-Trainer situation. I, I'm very much used to the old software. 
So I K-Vest and K-Trainer quite a lot. I did too. Um, but with juniors, I want to see that I move, that the things that I'm working on out on the range and with the drills we're doing and with their games are creating the changes. So I look at the K-Vest as a measurement system to check the effectiveness of my teaching more so than I look at it as a, a training system with the juniors. There are some juniors, though, that I've found that if, if you've got the K-trainers and you've, you've got a, a program set up for them, they'll treat it almost like a video game where they're trying to defeat it. So if you're trying to get very narrow ranges with them in terms of body positions, and that's going to be more in uh, static positions, address position, uh, top of the back swing, that kind of stuff, some of them will respond very well to the challenge of getting into that right spot. Uh, others, uh, and you just have to deal with this on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I've, I've got a couple of different players. Uh, one went to Stanford. Uh, he was a 20th ranked player in the country. Also on his team, this kid went to Northwestern. So both very, very good players. One absolutely loved the KVS and wanted to be on it, make sure his positions were perfect. The other one Hated didn't it. want to know anything about the K-Vest at all and just wanted to be out on the range hitting balls. So I would bring him in here for measurements. I would look at the graphs real quickly and we'd be out. The other kid, we would spend a bit more time in here uh, doing some drills and, and positional stuff for him. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks. I think when you're teaching, when you're teaching juniors, you've got to teach them to play golf, though. I know. You know, that, I know. The, being able to measure on the K-Vest makes us be able to shorten that time period that we're dealing with the swing mechanics, and it keeps you from having to guess and go too far down a road. You know, that's one of the things I think I appreciate most about the K-Vest is I never, if what I'm doing isn't creating the change in the graphs that I would expect, I can abandon that and start with a new, you know, a new, a new direction to try to get the results I'm after. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Chella. Thanks. And we do have uh, we have one more question on here. It is from Pete Cunningham. I'm just looking for him on the list. Just a moment. He wants to know how to cook a steak properly or something. <laughs> <laughs> you clearly don't know Pete. <laughs> Second. Pete, I'm having trouble unmuting you. Uh, just to... We have even there we go. There you go. Oh. Uh, Pete, I'm sorry I can't bring you off mute. For some reason, uh, GoToMeeting is not letting me. But I'll uh, relay your question. Uh, Pete said, I think you spoke of a transition drill in addition to hip twister. What transition drills do you like? Do you have a progression as transition starts to improve? Yes, yes. Uh, so hip twister is one of the very basic ones, and it's almost a, it's, it's, the, it's the first version. Hip twister phase one is going to be, hopefully that isn't covering it up, my mic up too much. Hip twister phase one is um, almost the uh, pelvic rotation test. Can the upper body stay relatively stable while the lower body moves. Uh, hip twister phase two is going to be with an upper body rotation, can we create that two to five degree uh, X factor stretch on the way down that we would want to. Uh, I found one where if we're having, if we're having a um, moment of inertia issues in terms of the, the player throwing their arms at it too early or getting the upper body uh, transitioning too close together. I love the orange whip swings because it really gets them to feel the weight of the club and the delay of the, of the uh, acceleration of the arm. But probably my all-time favorite one uh, would be a step change of direction. Um, I prefer it with a little bit more motion. Uh, one of the, the drills that you'll see that KVEST offers a short response where you're just going to start with club parallel to the ground and work on feeling that kind of an action where the lower body gets going. But I prefer the, the more dynamic move where we're going to get the club facing the target here and as the body rotates back away from the target, get them stepping towards it a little bit more. 
I found that there's a lot, it's, it's a lot harder for them to cheat when they're doing the step change of direction. Uh, and it creates, it's a little bit more of a power type move. Um, I have seen short response. In fact, I was at TPI one day when uh, Adam Scott was there a long time ago. Adam Scott or Aaron Badley, one of those guys. But from right in here, they were hitting, the, whichever one it was, I can't remember, uh, hitting 8 iron about 120 just with that little movement. So that was a pretty phenomenal uh, exhibition, but I haven't seen very many amateurs or even uh, good, good high school and college players that can be very effective that way. So I really do like going more to the uh, step change of direction drill for transition sequencing. Great. Thanks, Don. That, that's that's really helpful. Pete says thanks as well. Are there any more questions? Uh, let's circle back to see if Tim Ward has uh, has uh, come back in. Tim, can you hear us? I guess not. I guess not. Uh, well, everyone would like like to thank you. Uh, Don and I will be sticking around here for about the next five to ten minutes. Uh, again, we'd really like to thank you for being on today. Uh, we've been very lucky and fortunate to have uh, Don Parsons here and be able to share his wisdom with us. Uh, again, we're very fortunate. I'd like to thank you again, Don. Uh, we'll be sticking around again for about the next five to seven minutes. If there are any questions, please feel free to type them in that chat box and we'll make sure they get answered. Uh, we will I'll also put uh, my email out on the chat box. So if anyone has any questions that they may not have had the opportunity to get answered today, uh, please feel free to email me and I'll make sure that your questions get answered. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank, thanks for coming out, everyone. We have Alex Smith. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Michael, or uh, Andreas Kali is up first. And Michael Smith right behind. Andreas, can you hear us? Hello? Hello. Hello. Hi, Andreas. Hey, thanks a lot for doing this. I, um, I'm learning quite a bit here. Um, I just wanted to know um, what are your uh, what are your favorite speed drills for your juniors? Favorite speed drills for juniors? Yeah, I, I heard you, you do a lot of work with juniors. So I just I do do a lot of work with juniors. I have the the only big speed drill that I work on is a uh, speed series that uh, Tom House did. Um, that I learned about at the World Golf Fitness Summit about a year ago, to, yeah, last year about this time, uh, and that is a sequencing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a sequence of uh, swings. Starts off with uh, swings on the knees in both directions, okay? Uh, progresses to swings standing up, baseball swings, more standing up in both directions, and then a happy Gilmore type movement in both directions so that you get both uh, eccentric and con concentric uh, movements of the body. What I found, uh, particularly with my old business partner, we had guys that are hit, were hitting it very, very far. Uh, stability training tended to be one of the better things that uh, we could get the players doing, that the more stable they were uh, getting their body, the better the, whoops, sorry. the better that they were uh, creating decelerating sequences. So it was really a lot of that stability training that they were doing that created a lot of the power. Other than that, I work on, on more on making players good solid sequences and making sure that they're making good solid contact and controlling their ball flight. And distance is really taking care of itself with most of my players. Thank you, Don. My pleasure. Steve, you had somebody Hi, else in line? 
Hi, Don. Sorry, it's uh, Alex here. I was just wondering what the um, the best exercises and drills you use to get the peak speeds in the correct sequence and order. Uh, peak speeds in the in the correct order. Yeah. So, like, like I said, I could see you were going. Obviously, you had um, it was probably is a two one three sequence that the the gentleman had correct. earlier on. Yes. Uh, I, I I tell you, you were you were on it right from the very start. Uh, posture, I think, is enormous with regards to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Getting that, especially the pelvis. I think having good pelvic graphs. I rarely see good pelvic graphs where you don't see great sequencing uh, and sequencing speeds. Uh, so, pelvic positioning, uh, both in the forward bend and the amount of side bend and and the rotation that you're going to see. I think is the number one key, and then the second key would be the uh, transition sequence. I think getting transition down, even without perfect peaking order, I think peaking order, in, in my experience, peaking order is a little bit more uh, variable and can be slightly different than maybe the, the norms that have been presented, more so than the uh, transition sequence. I find that anyone who has great transition sequence hits it well, and I've, I've got one of my best ball strikers uh, almost has his pelvis and torso peak at the same time, very close okay. to the ball. Cool. Thank you. My pleasure. And next, thanks, Alex. And next up, we have Richard Franklin. So, a moment. Hey, Don. Richard, hey, Rick. hey, how you doing? Excellent. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I spent some time with um, Rob Neal, and we were taking a yes. look at um, at his uh, his software, um, you know, the eight sensor stuff, and we got to the discussion of um, pelvic bends, and he was of the opinion um, that just like the torso exchanging forward bend for side bend and losing, you know, so losing its forward bend component, that the pelvis, by nature of just turning half as much as the torso, that he's looking for the pelvis to lose half of its forward bend. So I'm curious why, um, first of all, your response to that, and then is there potentially something different about how um, you know, they're calibrating or they're uh, digitizing that would potentially change that graph in, in his in his mind because it seems like the cardinal sin in, in KBS world is to lose more than that three degrees of initial bend. So just your response to that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so the the first on well, the first question was, I'm sorry. Your first question was how much pelvic bend do I think it's okay to lose during the backswing? I guess, I mean, I think I know your answer to that. <laughs> my, 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 my question is, what do you say to somebody who says that it should be just, I never thought of it this way that, okay, so if you're losing all your forward bend in your torso and you turn your hip half as much, that logically you might lose half, half the bend value in the hips, why, why that would be not correct. Why, why, would you, why would you lose significantly less forward bend in the pelvis in relation to the torso, and what kind of mechanical advantage is there doing that? I, I don't mind losing more than, I guess I don't see people losing half. Okay. Uh, so I guess I, I would say that. I don't think there is a huge difference in the calibration. Uh, in talking to Phil Cheatham, I, again, I think Rob Neal and Phil's systems are pretty darn similar. Yep. And Phil has told me that, that the bend numbers and the rotation numbers that we see on either of those systems should be very similar to what we see on KS. Um, okay. Because of the calibration differences, though, I always take, with a little grain of salt, uh, starting bend at that, that address. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
Again, if, if we don't get the hip offset perfectly calibrated, if the sensor does slip on the pelvis just a little bit, I take, you know, I, I'm not going to begrudge even three or four degrees of pelvic bend uh, during the swing. Okay. What I want to see is a, a shape of the graph that looks like what I want to see it. I do like the idea of seeing the pelvic bend change quite a bit. Um, I'm, I would have to give it some thought and email you about half and okay. why I wouldn't think that half would be necessarily the big number. Yeah, is, Rob, you know, is, is Rob seeing half in his uh, data? We, we did see it in some of his examples. You know, I, I have um, the AMM, you know, whatever the, the, the free software is, just to look at their graphs and, and studying some of their their, their tour data. I, I don't I don't see half um, as common. So I just trying to make sense of uh, you know what, what he was thinking there. But I got I got one more thing if if I have a minute. Absolutely. Um, transition sequence. Um, Again, spurred on by um, the graph that Rob has in his software where he's talking about uh, the left arm in relation to the chest uh, as far as, let's just call it an across your chest nature. So if you took your left arm and you just hugged it across your chest there, yep, that right. you would obviously want to see that angle, depending on how you're looking at it, increasing in transition because your chest is exactly, but what I find, what I saw with your player there, let's just say someone who's got a very neutral club face orientation, who's already a little bit of a cutter, working on that transition, maybe overly pinning that left arm, then they can't recover. You know, I'm looking at a, I look at that lead, that chest to lead arm relationship is so important. That, that can they can they start that recovery of that left arm soon enough? Because You've seen it when, when you do the transition stuff, and the guys got poor club base alignment. You know, you've got you've got dead block shank sometimes as Definitely. an immediate result. So I'm always leery of crushing them on, on the transition stuff. So I wonder where you weigh in on all of that. Uh, that would be one one spot you would want to be careful with the orange whip drill that I gave. So, so you're absolutely right. Depending on you know, and, and you're going to talk about grip grip position and wrist angles and the way that people are going to release the club. Uh, you want to match those up with how hard we transition and how much that left arm is going to get across the body. So somebody with a relatively strong grip can get away with the arm being across the body pretty well and then a lot of pivot versus somebody with a little bit of weaker grip who's going to want to want to create a different wrist angle and, and type of wrist release coming into impact, you're right, you definitely doesn't, don't want that player way behind because now they're they're just trapped and they're going to drop kick it and, and do all yep. the other things you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you for your time, Don. Appreciate it. You bet. Thanks, Rich. And Don, we do have uh, one more question. I know we, uh, okay. I know you're a little tight on time, but uh, are you okay with one more? Absolutely. Great. Uh, we have Sean Dwyer again. Sean? There you go. Yeah, guys, can you hear me there? We can. Yes. Sorry, I got a little bit of a, a flu over here at the moment, but um, hey, thanks uh, thanks for doing this session. It's um, really good info to hear, um, hear you guys talking about uh, KBS and how you use it. Um, so I've got a couple of questions there. Um, firstly, when you were talking about um, force plates and shear forces, you know, um, when you haven't got them, what kind of resources are you referring to? That KBEST got some information out there on what they like for their ideals, or do you go and source your information from uh, from somewhere else? With regards to the force plates and such? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I haven't yet. I, again, I talked uh, quite a bit with uh, Mike Bentley you know, years ago when he was with KVEST, and then a couple years ago about some of that information and how to use that. I've talked a bit with Chris Welch about uh, the use of ground forces. Uh, to see more about that, I'm actually going down to Dallas in three weeks to meet with uh, Chris Como and uh, Dr. Kwan and find out some of the stuff they've got going on. Um, I've always been much more interested in how you're going to use shear forces in terms of pushing against the ground uh, horizontally to help rotations. So I've always been very much into the rotation. But 
um, how to couple that with some of the pressure stuff that we're seeing as well is, is stuff that I'm going to go ask guys that are way smarter than me. <laughs> That's a long list yeah. of guys that are way smarter than me, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I think most of us are in that boat, but uh, yeah, good. Um, I guess I was just yeah, wondering if you had some ideals that you kind of work with. It's, it seems to be a little bit hard to get some some good data out there um, of, of what are your ideals and what you're looking for if, um, if you don't actually have those force points well, there. Yeah, I think one of the things that makes that so difficult right now is that there are a lot of different things being measured there and they're measured in different ways. So mm -hmm. you've got a lot of apples to orange comparisons. Um, Kind of like some of the, the, I don't know if you guys are on the biomechanist group, but there have been a lot of discussions that way where the, all the arguments is based on either frame of reference being different from each person or the, the method of measurement being different between two systems. So it's really hard to compare those types of data. And sure. as far as I know, again, I just don't know a whole lot about the pressure and ground reaction force type measurement systems yet. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot there. That, Absolutely. That we yeah, want to yeah. know eventually. I agree. So I'll keep uh, keep researching and uh, and and learning. And um, the second one there is um, got a few uh, few young guys that I put through KVAS that are quite good players. And one just one recently that I've been seeing is um, um, a few of the guys have got reasonably good um, transition sequences, but um, sometimes getting a peak speed sequence. Um, uh, just writes a little bit tough, and one of the things I need to try and do is get those hips reaching peak speeds a little earlier on the downswing. Right. So just wondering if um, you know you come across it a little bit, and and if so, how you kind of go about trying to get those peak speeds a little earlier with those yep. hips. Yeah, definitely on, on on that. Some of the drills that we do, that split stance drill, where they're going to actually start feeling that lead foot pushing into the ground, trail foot pushing away. Uh, typically, the guys that try to just swing everything left, if the feet drive, if both feet drive left and everything goes over there, there's nothing to really help support from the ground up their ability to decelerate. So even if the upper body is is decelerating well, um, for instance, I had a, I have a little little tiny guy that I taught yesterday, and one of the things he does is everything he's got in terms of creating power is all jump. So when he comes off the ground like that, he's not able to use the, the shear forces on the ground. So again, I think the drills where you're going to have them split stance it here and work into that lead foot where they feel a lot of pressure pressing down into the lead foot and a lot of shear force pushing, pushing back, I call it the skateboard move, where they're going to really try to feel that foot, not that it actually slides, but that's the, the pressure they're putting on the ground. That's yes. one that really lets them load into that lead glute. Um, and earlier I talked about uh, what I've done over the years. Uh, the, the functional training that my old partner used to do with the guys, he had a, uh, a routine that he worked on uh, glute need just a ton so the guys could actually load and really feel the glute, catching them as they went forward and, and made them very aware of how they were going to use that to decelerate their swing on the fall through. Yeah. Yeah, really good. Excellent. Any other questions from anyone? I believe we had Jason Floyd just make a kind of quick continuance with what, what was being said about ground forces. Maybe I can just pull him off and you know he'd be a great Absolutely. person to end with if that's okay, Don. Absolutely. Jason? Hi, yeah, no, just, just a quick one with regards to maybe uh, say Tim Souza is possibly worth mentioning though, with regards to his knowledge on the on, on ground forces. I know he's uh, very knowledgeable and obviously in the um, in the on the KBS team. So maybe that's uh, for the previous gentleman who was asking about uh, getting hold of uh, good resources for for his knowledge and development. Right. Yeah. Tim. Tim. Tim knows a lot about that. Sorry, guys. Yeah, Tim. Tim has a lot of knowledge about the ground forces and how they work. Uh, it's a it's a pretty interesting conversation. Cool. All right. Well, I'm I'm going to let you go. <laughs> <Don't>. Beautiful. <laughs> I'm time for, for a cup of tea, tea Jace. I was going to say, <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> we'll speak. Take care.
Terrific. Thanks, Jason. Thanks very much. Fantastic. I'd uh, like to thank everybody again for being on. Thank Don for taking the time to be here. We really appreciate uh, Don's time and each and every one of yours. I know this everyone carved time out of their day to be on here. And you know we really appreciate it. Uh, what you will be seeing over the next couple days, uh, we'll be editing this down to a more manageable format and we'll be passing that along to everybody. So please keep your eyes peeled on the in your email. Uh, you'll be getting this very shortly. Thank you everyone. Thanks Steve. Thanks Don.